So as you will have gathered, if you've been following with us since Easter, we have been um, looking at post resurrection encounters with Jesus. And uh, as soon as we started talking about doing this sermon series, I claimed this one as mine. I like this part of scripture. And I think I might have actually preached on it last year at a similar time following Easter, but I love this portion of scripture. Now don't get me wrong, there's lots of other encounters with Jesus following his resurrection that are wonderful. That Easter morning when he appeared to the women outside the tomb and uh, the first people that Jesus saw and spoke to were women, the very least of society, lower than the children, people that could be bought and sold and traded. And Jesus appeared to them first and he re-established them as his loved and precious half, the female half of creation. I love that. I love the encounter on the Emmaus Road when the disciples say at the end, weren't our hearts burning within us as he opened the scripture to us? And um, it's great to think that the scripture still burns within us when God reveals himself to us through his word. And uh, I love the, uh, a couple of weeks ago when Dylan talked about doubting Thomas and Thomas is there saying, I will never believe it until I get, I think this is really gory and awful, but until I can put my finger in his wounds and my hand in his side, would anybody want to do that? I think it's personally disgusting. But Thomas needed that, he needed that assurance and Jesus turned up and he said, here we go, here's my hands, put your finger in the whole, because Thomas needed that and so Jesus offered it and it's a wonderful appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. And then last week when um, we heard about the disciples who had been fishing all night, these seasoned fishermen, this was their jobs, this, this was all they'd known before Jesus turned up three years earlier and um, said, follow me, and they caught nothing. And he just said, throw the net over the other side and it was full. The miracle of um, Jesus' master over creation. So many wonderful encounters. But this restoration of Peter by Jesus is something special. And it's something for each one of us. The parallels in this story from Peter's three denial in the courtyard when Jesus was arrested... It speaks of love, it speaks of forgiveness and compassion and restoration. And then the commission. Jesus gives Peter the commission to go and make a difference in the world for him. And one of my favourite Bible commentators and one of the world leading scholars of our time, um, Tom Wright, he agrees with me. That fills you with confidence, doesn't it, when you read a commentary and they agree with what you're thinking. He says, this scene between Jesus and Peter is one of the most spectacular interchanges in the whole of the Bible and perhaps all literature. The most spectacular interchanges. So in order to look at today's scripture, we need to go back and we need to look at John chapter 18, just three chapters earlier as Peter encounters his, uh, his denial of Jesus. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest and he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard but Peter had to wait outside at the door the other disciple who had no, was known to the high priest came back and he spoke to the servant girl on duty there and brought Peter in. You aren't one of these, men's, of these man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Strike one. It was cold. And the servants and the officials stood around the fire and they, they, they had made to keep warm. And Peter also was standing there warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. 
When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? And then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, Peter's second and third denials. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing, warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it by saying, I am not. Strike two. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. Strike three. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. I wonder, have any of you ever walked down the street or maybe walked into a shop or somebody's home and you have smelt a smell that brings back a memory? Maybe even a memory that you had forgotten, you didn't even know you had. If I ever smell tobacco smoke, it takes me back to my A-level geography teacher's office because he smoked like a trooper and he always stank in that office. But it takes me back to lovely memories of a wonderful teacher who was very encouraging and helpful and supportive to a student who was struggling at that time. If I ever smell lavender, it reminds me of wonderful times of my great aunt Margaret because she always loved lavender soap and lavender perfume and it made birthdays and Christmases really easy. That smell reminds me of her and her example of Jesus in my young life. If I ever smell a roast Sunday dinner, it reminds me of my nan and granddad and all the family Sunday lunches that we used to share together when I was a child. And only last week, our girls received a package in the post and it had some jumpers in there from uh, my sister. She'd uh, outgrown them, she decided to pass them on, so it was lovely that she posted them across. And as Eva pulled one of the jumpers over her head, she was heard to say, oh, it smells like Auntie Lydia. I love Auntie Lydia smell. <laughs> Which made us all chuckle. And uh, I typed it into a text message and sent that to my sister to make her smile too. You may be wondering why I am talking about smells. Well, a charcoal fire, they have a particular smell about them. Now, I considered a few times if I could bring one here and light it, but health and safety told me I couldn't. But I, I kept trying to figure out if there was a way around it, and obviously there isn't. No charcoal fire this morning. I can't describe that particular smell of the charcoal fire to you, but you know that you would recognise it immediately if you smelt it again. And it would transport you back to the last time you were around a charcoal fire to the last things that you said and did around the fire. And in John chapter 18, verse 18, which we've just read, Peter was warming himself by a charcoal fire. And then in John 21, today's scripture, verse nine, it just says, um, Jesus had lit a fire of burning coals and was cooking fish on the fire. He is the second charcoal fire. The smell of this fire on the beach would have called up for Peter and also for Jesus, the memory of that awful night. But Jesus did it so that he could heal the open wound that this horrendous experience had left within Peter. Only a few weeks later, and Jesus lit the fire the smell of the charcoal. Again, Tom Wright points out that in Mark's Gospel, the story of Peter's denial is interwoven with Jesus' interrogation. And while Jesus is telling the high priest the truth, G uh, Peter is telling lies to the servants in the courtyard outside. While Jesus is speaking openly of his mission and his reason for being on earth, Peter is doing his best to hide. And yet at least Peter was there. 
unlike the other disciples. And in John's Gospel, in this account, he tells the story very simply, and he doesn't mention that after the cock had crowed, like the other Gospel writers do, that Peter went out of the courtyard and he wept bitterly. He burst into tears. But I know that if you just for a moment put yourself into Peter's shoes and you imagine those three years as his disciple and you imagine sitting with Jesus at the Last Supper just a few hours before this had happened, when he warns Peter that this is going to happen, that he will deny him, and that accusation completely rocks Peter and he's like, I can't possibly deny you. And then you imagine yourself in the garden and Jesus being arrested and Peter was so angry he lobbed off the ear of one of the people that had come to arrest Jesus. And then he saw Jesus being dragged away. And imagine the confusion and the anger and the pain that Peter was feeling. And then you imagine the guilt and the, of the denial. And I'm sure you too would burst into tears if you put yourself in Peter's shoes. And the smell of the charcoal fire brings that memory back. Only the gentle but probing wisdom of the Good Shepherd could heal such a hurt. And here, by yet another smelly fire, do we find the Good Shepherd providing this healing. Just an abbreviated reading from today. When they had finished eating, Jesus said, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more th- more than these yes lord he said you know that i love you number one and jesus said feed my lambs again jesus said simon son of john do you love me and he answered yes lord you know that i love you number two jesus said take care of my sheep and a third time he said to him simon son of john do you love me And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Number three. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Then he said, follow me. The three questions correspond with Peter's three denials. Three for completeness. Three, also, as a reminder. And the smell of the charcoal fire lingers. Peter's night of agony and failure and Jesus' own night of agony returns in their memory. But because of the questions, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The failure is dealt with. Jesus is the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Peter's sin is gone. Your sin is gone. My sin is gone. We're all like Peter. We've all messed up, yes. We've all failed, yes. We've all sinned. And as scripture puts it, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But if we love Jesus, and if we let him, then he will draw near like he did for Peter. And through his grace and his love, he does forgive us and he does draw us back. He reconciles us to himself. But that's not all. The most remarkable thing in this scripture is that in his forgiveness, Jesus gives Peter a job to do. When Peter professes his love, Jesus doesn't say, well then, Peter, that's all right. Well done. Jesus says, feed my lambs, look after my sheep, feed my sheep. In the Life Application Bible, it says this in the little notes at the bottom. In this beach scene, Jesus led Peter through an experience that would remove the cloud of his denial. 
Peter has denied Jesus three times and three times Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. When Peter answered yes, Jesus told him to feed his sheep. It is one thing to say that you love Jesus, but the real test is your willingness to serve him. And it's a shame we've gone into summer uniform this week because I haven't got my S's on. Saved to serve an S on each lapel. We are saved. Salvation Army soldiers, we are saved to serve God. I was talking to my mum this week. I'll get back to the quote in a minute. She's retiring in a few weeks' time and uh, she's just been on a retirement conference on Zoom, of course. And um, she was saying that uh, the first day of the retirement conference, they were informed that they will never, ever cease to be called to ministry, even when they retire. And um, she really does profess that honestly and truly, that there will never be a retirement within ministry. We are saved to serve. God always has something for us to do. Always. The Life Application Bible goes on to say, Peter had repented, and here Jesus was asking him to commit his life. Peter's life changed when he finally, finally realised who Jesus was. His occupation changed from fisherman to evangelist. His identity changed from impetuous Peter. Remember, just moments earlier, he'd launched himself out of the boat, fully dressed, to the rock on which I will build my church. His relationship with Jesus changed. He was forgiven, and he finally understood the significance of his life. Jesus' death and resurrection, it finally dawned on Peter. When we mess up like Peter did, forgiveness is always available. There are things, there is nothing officially on record against us. God wipes the slate clean. He talks about washing us as white as snow. There is nothing on record. Our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. But there may still be plenty of memories and imaginations, our old failings, our old scores, our old wounds. Maybe nothing that we've done, but things that were done against us. And we need to come to Jesus, like Peter did, around the charcoal fire. And we must have it dealt with before we can operate and serve Jesus to our maximum efficiency. Jesus can and he will forgive you. Jesus can and he will restore you. Jesus can and he does want you to serve him. But we must first come to him, just like in our story today, and say, Lord, I love you. And then we must serve. So a question, do you love Jesus? And how are you serving him today? Don't allow your past to get in the way. Your past feelings and hurts and those people and things that you can't forgive, don't allow them to get in your way. Don't allow the devil's lies to stick. You can't. You're not good enough. You'll never be able to. Jesus restored Peter around the charcoal fire. And I invite you today to come around a charcoal fire in your mind because I can't light one in the building. Come to the charcoal fire and be restored and leave the charcoal fire with a commission from God. Face those past failings, accept Jesus' forgiveness and restoration, declare in your heart, Lord, you know that I love you, and then go and serve him. And then if this week, if God challenges you to serve him within our church, And there are oh so many opportunities to serve him within this church, never mind other opportunities of service across our island. Then come and speak to myself and Dylan. We're going to listen to a lovely song, Lord, I come to you. Chosen one that I know you will know. 
Let my heart be changed, renewed. I invite you to come. Come to the mercy seat. Come to our equivalent of Jesus' charcoal fire. Come and receive that forgiveness, that restoration, that rebuilding and that commission to go and feed the lambs. Go and feed the sheep. Look after God's people.
know there's at least one person here this morning that needs that restoration because the Holy Spirit's telling me and don't either don't leave this place or don't allow a week to pass without coming to the charcoal fire and meeting Jesus there is nothing in your past that can separate you from Jesus Christ there is nothing that you have done or has been done to you that can separate you from him It is a place of restoration. Jesus offers his forgiveness and his recommissioning. He not only forgives you, but he builds you back up and sends you back out. And that's been offered to every one of us today. It wasn't just offered to Peter. It's offered to everybody. So do do not let this week go by without coming to the charcoal fire and meeting Jesus. And if that needs to be done with myself and Dylan, then let us know and we will pray with you. But I beg you, don't let the restoration that Jesus offers pass you by. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful encounter that we see in Scripture where Peter so failed you and let you down in your time of agony and need and yet you were so willing to forgive and not just to forgive but to restore and not to restore 50% or 75% but 100% restoration and he got sent out and Peter became the rock on which the church was built. And we are here today because of that rock that Peter started to build. So complete is your restoration that you offer to each one of us. Father, today I pray that each one of us here in this place and anybody listening online will know that we can meet you at the charcoal fire, that you will forgive us and heal us and restore us and send us out. Give us that courage to be your sending people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.